All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you to the Simons Foundation for this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Happy Wednesday. Uh, happy birthday to my mom. I think she's out there in the audience. Uh, these are a few of the things that I, uh, I, I like to think about. Um, I, uh, I started in graduate school um, studying um, stochastic partial differential equations uh, from a sort of a pure math point of view. And um, you know, there were two things that I tried to separate myself from when I was a graduate student. I said, I'm a pure mathematician in probability, which means I don't do applied math and I don't do statistics. And as it turns out, I spend most of my time doing applied math with a heavy flavor of statistics these days. Um, I, uh, it was during my postdoc that um, I was introduced to a number of um, interesting applications for random movement of um, different types of particles in biological systems. And, uh, and so I developed uh, some work there. And then when I got to Florida, I met uh, these people in the ecology department and they said, oh, I have this really cool um, you know, data set with you know, panthers and pythons and jackals. And I was like, well, that sounds really cool. And, uh, and I started working on that stuff, assuming that everything I did for microparticles would translate well. And of course, none of it did, um, but these have kept me busy over the years. And uh, so I'm gonna talk mostly about the microparticle stuff today. And these pictures here uh, are all uh, data sets collected by collaborators of mine. I'm extremely fortunate to have met some really uh, imaginative and, and, and great experimentalists along the way. So these first two pairs, these are the ones that vandalize that Simons Foundation uh, lead page. Uh, these are two um, uh, polystyrene beads, 500 nanometers in radius. Uh, one is diffusing in sucrose, and the other is diffusing in healthy human lung mucus. And you know, you'll note that the one in sucrose seems to move more than the one uh, in mucus. And you know, my collaborator Greg Forrest. Uh, so this was collected by David Hill. Uh, Greg Forrest uh, likes to talk about. Uh, the race that's happening inside our bodies between um, all the stuff that we would take in. Uh, so if you want to breathe and you want oxygen from the outside world, um, you're going to have all these other things that are going to encounter you too. And so, um, you know, every, as the saying goes, every um, part of your body that's not covered in skin is covered in a thin, maybe 10 micron thick layer of mucus um, that filters out all this stuff from the outside world. And there are various clearance systems. So for example, in your lungs, you have this layer of mucus that's all over um, and you know, all kinds of particulates come in and get caught there. And you have these cilia that sort of you know, push the things up and massage the, the mucus and it flows upwards uh, until it gets to your esophagus and, uh, and you swallow. And uh, you know, my favorite stat is that um, you swallow every day uh, on the order of a leader of mucus uh, clearing out uh, all these systems from inside your lungs. And so uh, the goal is, you know, clearance systems within the body versus bacteria and viruses, other things that try to, you know, permeate those layers. And so it's interesting to know uh, if the, the movement of those particles is different than say classical Brownian motion. Uh, another such example, again, I met a collaborator through Greg Forrest, Sam Lai. Uh, and by the way, on the right are the, the graduate students that I've worked with, that Hung Wen on the previous slide and Melanie Jensen, who led the analysis of these projects on the mathematical side. Uh, and here there are two frames where you see two different populations of herpes uh, simplex virus virions, uh, as Sam uh, calls them. Um, moving in mouse cervical vaginal mucus. Uh, and the, what Sam was doing in this particular data set uh, was proving um, a phenomenon that was controversial at the time. Uh, namely, you know, we all know about, uh, now everybody's much more educated about spike proteins on the surface of uh, viruses and how antibodies interact with them. And, uh, and it's you know, one of the mechanisms that antibodies you know, help the body fight viruses is that they cover those spike proteins that, you know, prevent them from hitting target cells. Um, but it also turns out that they, um, uh, that the other side of an antibody has a very weak interaction with mucus. And so what can happen, or what the thesis was, is that uh, if you have, uh, this is the, the cartoon here, you have these virions with the spikes on the outside and the little Ys are the antibodies. Uh, and the back part has this very weak interaction. But if you get enough antibodies on the surface of the, the virion, then they can serve to entangle it. And so here you see a bunch of 
particles, a bunch of uh, virions moving around when there are no endogenous, no added, uh, sorry, exogenous antibodies, uh, IgG in particular. And then here is a similar population uh, in, the, in a similar, um, you know, from the same donor mucus. And you can see much less activity um, when the antibodies are there. And this goes towards, um, you know, you know, showing that uh, this is yet another mechanism that antibodies can, um, can you know, help the body defend against viral invasions. Um, and on the ecology side, I won't talk about this today, but I just always like, you know, uh, just to, to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we think about. Um, the two paths on the left that you see are the paths of uh, a jackal in Namibia. And on one day, uh, the jackal makes this long adventure out to, I believe this is a watering hole, so it's sort of a permanent resource. And on a different day, um, there is a, you know, through, um, through uh, Steve, who is the guy, Steve Bellin, who went out and tracked down, actually put collars on these jackals to, uh, to, uh, to track them. Um, he, uh, we know that there was a zebra carcass here and the, uh, the jackal's behavior changes in the presence of changes in the environment. And that's, you know, one of the major themes is that you can think of, you know, there's an intrinsic sort of movement behavior and then there's behavior that's modified by the environment. And that modification is usually of interest in, uh, in biological questions. Um, and I would be remiss to not mention uh, the Southeast Center for Math and Biology, which is funded by the Simons Foundation and the NSF. Um, I am working with uh, Keisha Cook, who is a postdoc here at Tulane, and I've been partnered with Christine Payne that, uh, through Christine Heitz, who played matchmaker on this particular, uh, on, on, on all the pairs in the, the Southeast Center. Uh, and uh, Christine has hired Nathan Rayens, a graduate student there. And this picture here, this video, gives you a feel for um, what um, particle movement looks like. Uh, these are lysosomes in, um, in HeLa cells. So if you um, have never heard of HeLa cells, or have you, you know, HeLa is Henrietta Lacks. If you, if you haven't seen, the movie's more public now. When I first mentioned this stuff, people hadn't heard it. But one of the best hours of radio that I know of out there is if you Google Henrietta Lacks in Radiolab, you can hear about um, these cells and um, and they just serve as a default for trying to understand all kinds of questions. Um, and uh, for us, you know, we might look at a cell like this and you see these uh, little things sort of flying all over the place. What's happening is that there are these motor proteins, molecular motors. Uh, there's a kinesin family and a dynein family. One tends to take things away from the cell nucleus. The other tends to take things back towards the cell nucleus. Um, they move at different speeds from different distances. And you could imagine, you know, for example, uh, a question that, you know, and this is something that Christine has worked on, uh, you know, if you introduce toxic nanoparticles, uh, uh, titanium dioxide, for example, uh, you can ask how does that or does that affect this intracellular transport? And of course, intracellular transport is you know critical for gene expression, other things like this. So there's this connection between sort of modifications that we might make that sort of change things at a population scale. And the the real challenge, and this is sort of a theme in our center, is what are the best ways to quantify overall changes like this? How can we, you know, there's there are reductionistic approaches, how do we look at them one by one? And then there are population approaches. Uh, how do we compare before and after and say, you know, goodness, stuff has changed in a in a meaningful way. Um, and you know, Keisha's work. Uh, you know, one of the things that sort of jumps out in this particular data set, you may have noticed that the particles sort of switch directions and they pause and they do all kinds of different things. Uh, what's really important in this work is uh, being able to segment the paths to to, to take them from sort of, um, you know, these, this is X, Y position. So green is at the beginning of the path and red is at the end of the path. So it's stuck for a little while here and then it moves and then it's stuck again over here. This is time versus the X axis. This is time versus the Y axis. And in that X axis, you can see that there's a period right here. Those two, um, you know, those two marks are created by Keisha's, uh, you know, segmenting algorithm. And we quantify, um, you know, you know, under different um, under different circumstances, how does uh, the the rate of change change? How does the, how do the switch rates change? How do uh, how does the velocity distribution change? Do they? You know, uh, you know, trying to find 
uh, meaningful ways that intracellular transport you know, is affected by external circumstances. So the theme among all these different things that I work on is that we have access, access to videos that track individuals on the order of seconds or minutes, but the biological processes of interest, you know, maybe it's um, you know, gene expression, maybe it's uh, infection by viruses, maybe it's you know, uh, you know, biofilms forming, whatever, they take place in the scale of hours or days. So how do we extrapolate in sort of a uh, res mathematically responsible way from short behavior to long behavior. And that's where you have this sort of connection. We need to articulate mathematical models. We need to do statistical inference. We need to do simulations and analysis to sort of project over longer timescales. And we need to put bounds on what we can claim. We need to be able to say when we're not sure about something. All right, so how do we go about building those models? So uh, I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about uh, sort of the history of, um, you know, behind modeling uh, random movement. Uh, so this is Robert Brown, Brown of Brownian Motion. He published a paper in 1828. And when probabilists tell each other bedtime stories, um, they, uh, they say, oh, you know, this, this, this continuous time random walk was first discovered by Robert Brown. He was a botanist and he was looking at pollen grains. And you know, certainly my impression of the story at some point was that he looked under a microscope, much like we do now, and could see things that people couldn't see before. And he said, hey, look, this stuff is moving around a lot. And everybody said, okay, great. We'll call that Brownian motion. Uh, but it turns out his contribution was, was uh, more profound than just observing it. Uh, so if you look at that original paper, um, at the time, they knew you know, pollen grains were associated with the, the plants reproducing. And so it was reasonable to believe that when he saw it, he wasn't the first to see sort of the continuous agitated motion of the pollen grains. They thought it, maybe it's alive. Maybe these are little creatures or maybe this, there's something about it being organic that is why it's continuing its agitated motion. And Brown's observation, uh, and this is the longest title of a paper, a brief account of microscopical observations in the months of June, July, August. I don't know what happened in September, but he stopped at that point. Um, he says on the particles contained in the uh, pollen of plants and on the general existence of active molecules in organic and inorganic bodies, it occurred to him uh, through the experiments that um, you know the first thing he did was he took it from live plants and then he waited to make sure that the plants were completely dead, really dead, and then saw that the pollen grains were still moving. And he's like, well, they can't be alive because they would have died by now, probably. So then he just kept going more and more inorganic. He looked at ash in which, you know, and, and he looked at, you know, he ground up stone. Um, uh, I think at some point he, he claims to have used a piece from the Sphinx. Uh, he used a fragment from the Sphinx, which is as old as it can be in his mind. And what he found was that no matter what, the behavior was always the same. And so his contribution is actually that it's not what the particles are made of, but in fact, it's the size of the particles that is uh, what's responsible for their agitated movement. So that was 1828, 1905. So almost 100 years later before we get a fuller explanation of what was going on. And you may have heard of this guy. So, Albert Einstein had a pretty good year in 1905. Uh, he uh, had special relativity, which we uh, all know about now. Uh, he proposed uh, E equals MC squared, the equivalence of energy and mass. He first proposed the photoelectric effect in a paper in 1905, which eventually led to his Nobel, Nobel Prize. And then in his spare time, he also gave the foundational paper in uh, diffusion, in, in Brownian motion and explaining what it was. And the reason he was interested in the time is because in 1905, it still wasn't settled whether or not um, the, you know, the, the molecular or atomic theory of uh, fluids were still, was still controversial. And so what he did in this paper was, uh, was argue that, the, that what's happening is that these particles are small enough that they feel the, the fluctuations within the fluid, uh, collisions from individual particles. Um, and he made some predictions about uh, how individual particles would, would move over time, how a population of particles would diffuse and spread. And you know, not only did he, uh, did, he, did he come up with this expression, but the expression was in terms of Avogadro's number. 
So in effect, what he said to the community is not only do I believe that these particles are moving like this because they're colliding with other smaller particles, he said, here, allow me to count them for you. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, I'll, you know, I don't have good enough data to prove this, but certainly if somebody else uh, is interested, they could. And I believe it was Perrin who just four years later confirmed Einstein's predictions. Okay. So the methods that he used at that time, we would recognize as sort of statistical mechanics, population scale arguments. But Langevin in 1908, so very soon afterwards, said there must be a Newtonian expression for this. And so I've written this using the notation he used in his original paper, uh, you know, it's on the, you know, you know Brown, the theory of Brownian motion. And he wrote it uh, as a, uh, you know, F equals MA. So we have mass times acceleration over here. Um, we have uh, a drag term. So you have the, the velocity multiplied by some coefficient. That coefficient, uh, so we're assuming that there are spherical particles. And, uh, and so according to that, the drag by Stokes law should be six times pi times the dyna dynamic viscosity of the fluid times the radius of the particle. Uh, and so that's that term. And then he wrote another term, which he called the thermal agitation. And it's interesting to actually see, you know, the, the terminology that they used at the time. So he says, in actual fact, uh, this value is only a mean. So he's talking about the, the drag effect is only a mean. Uh, and by reason of the irregularity of impacts of the surrounding molecules, the action of the fluid on the particle oscillates around the preceding value. About the complementary force chi, we know that it is indifferently positive and negative, and that its magnitude is such that it maintains the agitation of the particle, which the viscous resistance would stop without it. Okay, so he gives this sort of very general description of what this thermal agitation term is, but then makes a statistical argument. He treats this thing as an ODE and he has some forcing and he, and, he, and he does a calculation. And eventually he makes a prediction that matches Einstein. So why was he satisfied with what he did? He matched uh, Einstein's um, prediction uh, on what's called the mean squared displacement. So um, for a random walk, it's been known for a long time that the variance grows linearly in time if you have a mean zero random walk. And so this is a mean zero motion. And so as it grows with time, there should be uh, you know, some kind of dependence on the temperature. Uh, Boltzmann's constants could be written as the, you know, the inverse of the Avogadro's number there. Uh, and so KVT, which you may notice is also the, the fundamental unit of energy in equipartition of energy, that, that's a part of the argument, uh, divided by the drag. And so the, 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 the more drag there is in the system, the, the thicker the, the, the viscosity, the less particles move within it. So, that's the Langevin equation. And you can think of this as one of the, you know, the first stochastic differential equation. Now, I should say there are some other people who I'm not, you know, going to be able to, to, um, to, to capture everybody who was along in this process. Um, somebody named uh, uh, Bachelier um, proposed Brownian motion in 1900 in the context of financial mathematics. And apparently some, I haven't read the paper, but someone named Sutherland proposed an argument very similar to Einstein in 1905. And Smolachowski made his PDE understanding of Brownian motion in 1906. So this is extremely active time. Very suddenly, everybody started to have a, a, a revisit Brownian motion. So just two more notes. So if we're going to have mathematical concerns. So Norbert Wiener uh, in 1923 wrote a paper named Differential Space. The reason he called it Differential Space is because he recognized that the essential part of Brownian motion is the increments. So the differences between times of observations. And he was the first to show that Brownian motion makes sense as a mathematical object. Uh, it has continuous sample paths, disjoint increments that are, so disjoint increments are independent of each other. They're stationary, they don't change over time. Uh, they're Gaussian distributed with mean zero and a variance proportional to the length. So that's that mean squared displacement growing with time. Okay. But then Wiener throws in a little catch, which is that the paths are not just not differentiable some places, they're nowhere differentiable. And that's a problem if you want to define a differential equation in terms of this thing over here, which is what we would now call white noise, um, you know, white noise being the derivative of Brownian motion, um, there's no such function type thing. So it wasn't until 1946, and to put a year on Ito's contributions uh, is not quite right. I mean, he, he made a, a steady progression on stochastic integration, stochastic differential equations, and, and so forth. 
Uh, and he introduced a notation. He understood that there's no such thing as a stochastic differential equation. There are only stochastic integral equations. And what we write uh, in terms of stochastic differential equations is just a shorthand. Uh, but he made sense of these and you can solve this using Ito's formula. There's a, you know, he recognized that the chain rule for uh, nowhere differentiable functions like this is different than the regular chain rule. Um, and you can get a prediction, you can solve this and you, you know, uh, and, and what you find is that if you're going to have uh, mass times acceleration, you have your drag term, you have a sigma times the noise, that sigma has to have this form in order to match the mean square displacement squ uh, slope. So two times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times gamma, the, uh, the, the drag, which is the drag. So this fact that the uh, gamma, the drag appears in both this is the drag coefficient appears both in this drag term and in the fluctuations is called the fluctuation dissipation relationship. It's this idea that, you know, the same thing that causes the fluctuations, which is the collision of particles in the environment, is what causes the drag if you try to push a particle through it. And so they have to be in just the right balance to maintain, you know, as, as, um, as, uh, as Langevin says, to maintain uh, movement over time. So the beautiful thing about Langevin's equation, you know, being, you know, it, you know, you have mass times acceleration on one side, and then you have a sum of forces on the right side, is that you can very easily introduce other forces. So you can put an external force, uh, which is often expressed in these terms. So you have, you know, phi, which is some potential well, so some potential energy associated with every position. And I'll write gradient throughout the talk, but I'm actually also going to write most things in terms of 1D. So you know, you can think of this as phi prime if you want. Um, but the idea is that you know the the, the motion that the force is uh, along a gradient, trying to reduce the potential energy as fast as possible. Um, but the point is that just by adding superposition of terms, adding more and more terms, you can. Uh, it's a great modeling framework. You can understand how these forces sort of resolve each of themselves. And so. You know, a, a classic example, um, so sometimes, you know, so forgive me for doing these cartoons, but sometimes they're better than actual <laughs> simulations. Um, so, you know, here's a double well potential. It's a famous example. You know, you have a, a deep well over here and a, and a shallow well over here. The force due to this well is the derivative, the negative of the derivative at whatever point. So if a particle is way out here on the right, you can see that the derivative is increasing. So the negative of the derivative is pushing it back in this direction. Um, so you can imagine that it's like a little particle that's caught in this well and it gets energy from its collisions and then eventually it might jump over and then go into this deeper well. So I have a little sketch of what a particle like this might look like. Maybe it starts in the shallow well and then it dives into the deeper well and then goes you know, for a long time and then crosses over, uh, spends a little time there and keeps going back and forth. Um, so there's a famous friedland wenzel theory that talks about how to, uh, how, how to answer basic questions about, you know, th things we like to ask beyond mean and variance is probably, you know, first passage times, you know, how long does it take for me to cross from one well to the other? Uh, Long-term occupancy, like in the long run at every, at any given position, how much time do I spend there? And it turns out there's a, you know, a very beautiful relationship between the potential well and the time that you spend in different places. So if you, ex you know, take the negative of the potential well, uh, if you're including the, uh, the velocity. So I've integrated out the velocity in this particular picture. Um, but if you, um, if you just take E to the negative of the potential well, you get, um, you know, the lower parts here are larger here. So you spend more time in that deeper well and less time in the other well, okay? And, the fact that there's this connection between paths and the amount of time that we spend in one place or another is, is called ergodicity. Uh, so we have Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. And it says that time averages equal ensemble averages. So if I take a par particle and I run it for long enough, uh, and then I average, and I found my first typo of the thing, this should be a one over t right here. <laughs> Um, so there's a one over T times this integral. So if I run it for long enough and I average my function, whatever nice function it is, then um, I will get the same answer if I 
no with this stationary measure. A stationary measure is if I start a whole bunch of particles according to this distribution and I go and look later, then um, they will look the same later on. Uh, an ensemble average is take that same function and integrate against that. And so time averages equal ensemble averages is sort of one way of understanding, you know, that's the ergodic property. And we, and it's a very, very, what I want to stress is a very, very practical thing. Um, so, uh, you know, if you think about it, what, what experimentalists are doing is, you know, in this whole practice of saying, I'm going to run an experiment for a short amount of time. Uh, I'm going to model it, and then I'm going to extrapolate to a longer period of time. I'm saying that my, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that my system is in stationarity, and that my multiple observations from that stationarity projects to the long term, so I can understand things beyond my experimental window. So that's that's actually the ergodic theorem in practice. On the other hand, there are people who want to simulate complex systems. So this is a case where you don't know what that stationary distribution is. And it's hard to, to, to start from it. So what you do often is run one path for an extremely long period of time. Uh, and then you, you, you sort of cut it off at different stages. And whatever stage, wherever you cut it off, that's like starting anew in the stationary distribution. So this ergodic theorem is, is uh, or this idea of time averages equal, equaling ensemble averages is pivotal to what we're trying to do in terms of extrapolating or going in both directions um, in, uh, in these exercises, okay? And I'll come back to um, this ergodic theorem later on. So, you know, in terms of intracellular transports, I just wanna show you one, uh, you know, simple example of uh, modeling and then this thing sort of playing out. So we're back to Langevin's equation and you know these external forces, what kind of external forces uh, make sense for say the, the data that Christine Payne collects? Well, we might do a couple of simplica simplifications first. So one is that this mass relative to the other uh, terms is often extremely small. So this is a singular perturbation, you can think of it, and you're taking that away. So there's, you know, you have to make sure that that's safe to do. But this gamma V becomes dx. So it's a derivative there, divide through by gamma. Uh, and then this KBT, you know, square root of KBT over gamma, when I divide by gamma, this becomes square root of 2D, this diffusivity thing again. So this is Langevin's equation and the overdamp limit. And some examples of uh, forces that might take place on a tiny cargo like a lysosome or something like that is, uh, well, there, there is a force that's exerted by the molecular motor. So you can think of, you know, the motor as being a tether and it attaches to microtubules, which are like the, the roads of the, of, the, of the cell. And once it attaches to that point and the cargo sort of fluctuates around it, so we can treat, if we want, we can say that it's like a hooky and spring, or we can model it as a worm-like chain, or we can make different choices, each of them you know, being some kind of potential. Um, experimentalists often use what are called optical traps. So, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I should say, um, you know, in using, well, you know, the, in the original experiments, uh, actually they use the optical traps for both of these experiments. Um, you know, so these things, are, you know, the stall force of a molecular motor, the amount of force that's necessary to stop this thing is on the order of piconewton. So for, for you know, for, for kinesin, for example, 10 to the 12, 20 to the negative 12 newtons is the thing. So my collaborator, Will Hancock, likes to say, um, if, you, um, if you put a penny on the ground and you shine a flashlight on it and you do the statistics, that's about a piconewton of force. And uh, uh, what, an optical trap can uh, concentrate that that level of force on a cargo. You can see this picture, and then you know, say the motor the motor just moves away. So this is like the, the you know, if you know Sisyphus from Greek mythology, this is the Sisyphus experiment. You know, Sisyphus has the rock, and it walks away, and the um, the trapping beam. You can think of it as sort of a quadratic potential. The force becomes larger the farther away it gets from the center, uh, until the force is enough to stall it, and so the particles just sort of fluctuating. And eventually it gives up and then it starts walking back out and it starts fluctuating again. Um, in these experiments, these are some of the original molecular motors experiments, you could, this is how they discovered that there's actual stepping. So the way to think about these motors is that they have two 
unfortunately named heads. Um, they walk on their heads. It's one of those things where you see the structure before you realize what it's doing. Um, but uh, they have these two heads and they sort of alternately uh, step. And you can see if you take ATP way, way, way down, uh, you know, which is the fuel that drives these, you can see these individual steps going uh, eight nanometers apart for kinesin. And those fluctuations around it are uh, the cargo being subjected to some kind of, you know, effectively a potential well from the, those uh, from the um, from the anchored point. So, you know, if it is quadratic, then you can take this, you know, um, this this gradient of a potential and it becomes linear. And so here we have just a very basic linear additive noise system. And to show you what these things look like, um, you know, here is a simulation to sort of emulate just for fun what these stepping behavior looks like. So, so suppose that your motor is taking individual steps, treat that as a Poisson process, so exponential time between steps. Um, each of these little dots in this picture are times that the motor underneath Z of T took a step. Um, they're eight nanometers in size. And then the fluctuations here are the locations of X, you know, just using a simple numerical method. And so it fluctuates. And then once the step occurs, it jumps. Uh, and it jumps and it jumps. These dashed lines are eight, eight nanometers apart. Uh, and they're meant, you know, you can calibrate this thing to match the size of the fluctuations and the times and so forth. And being random, it does something else the next time you run it. Um, and then it does something else. Kind of got really excited here and made three jumps in a very short window here, right? So you can simulate these things over and over again. Um, but you know, and over this time scale, so this is over a time scale of 10 uh, uh, microseconds in the way that I did this one. Uh, and you can see that it's kind of a jumbled mess when I superimpose those, right? But a very important thing about probability theory is that probability theory is in many ways the anti-chaos theory. So it's always sad to me when people are so excited about chaos. It's not sad to me, I love chaos and everything. But, uh, you know, chaos theory is always saying something like, you know, oh, the butterfly sneezes and then that causes the bird to cough and then the bird, you know, dives down and that causes a little bit of wind. And then that causes some kind of, you know, sandstorm and that goes over the Atlantic and then becomes a hurricane and hits Louisiana down the road. You know, it's a big chain of events that comes from a little tiny event. But in probability theory, you know, if a butterfly sneezes in one direction, there's probably another butterfly that sneezed in the other direction to kind of average it out a little bit. And, you know, so here you have all this look of randomness on some scale, but if you zoom out enough or in just the right way, these irregular events become extremely regular. And here within five seconds in the time scale of this numerical experiment, my, you know, cloud of particles all have a very obvious velocity over time. Uh, and that explains, you know, some of what we see when we see experiments. So why bother with all this randomness at different scales? Well, the randomness sometimes informs what those means are going to be. And so the idea is that understanding things at this sort of micro or nano scale can feed into phenomena that we see at a larger scale. Um, and, you know, as my, uh, was one of those people who tempted me with applied math uh, when I was a postdoc, Mike Reed, uh, you know, he said, if your theory isn't robust, it isn't biological. And so a lot of what we do is you, you look for all the things, all, all the random events that can inform large scale behaviors. But um, ultimately, you know, uh, your motors have like a certain speed and, you know, they're not going to come shooting out of your leg or something like that, or, you know, blow up the cell. There's like very, you know, they're, they're, it is confined and these are, these dynamics are, you know, robust. So, the reason I went through all this is just to say that launch event dynamics, they give us a, a flexible framework for model building, right? Uh, we can perform statistical inference on these stochastic differential equations. We can do numerical simulation. Uh, we can do rigorous analysis sometimes. And they all, in, in this way, we connect those experiments uh, that happen on a short scale to much larger scale um, events. And you know, interestingly enough, usually there's randomness at that meso scale, and then you have to take the scale up again. So before I move to the next um, the next section, are there any questions? Maybe I can pause for a moment. Um. Yes, 
Scott, I think there was a question about the, um, the with the two well picture that you had. Yes. Um, whether that is, uh, what, what sort of the take home message from that might be. And we were, so, so one of the ways that I was describing it is that we can't know um, we can't know what any individual particle is doing at a specific moment in time, but we can ask questions about what particle particles plural on average might be doing, right. or you know, or what a single particle might be doing over a long period of time, which is this uh, Birkhoff's er ergodic theorem. So, with the wells, the an individual particle is doing something, maybe it's in the, the shallower well, it bounces around for some time, and then it gets enough energy that it goes over the hump and it ends up in the deeper well and it spends a whole bunch of time there, but eventually it bounces around enough so that it gets to the top of the stack and moves back. And that those are things that we can perhaps characterize very well in, um, in contrast to some of the more biological examples that you've been talking about. Yeah, so there's, you know, so this double well, yeah, so, so, so yeah, you, 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 um, you describe it, um, you know, the, the, the heart of it very well that, you know, the idea, especially when you're collaborating with experimentalists is that you have these sort of short things and you wanna understand what's happening on a short scale and then how does that predict what's going to happen on a longer time scale through that ergodic theorem. And that double well potential, uh, one of the slides that didn't make the talk, but um, in that, um, that study that we did of, uh, of the viruses being trapped and entangled with the, uh, in, the, in the mucosal networks, um, there is something akin to a double net well network there. The basically, you know, the particle moves around for a while and has these very brief sort of interactions with in collisions with the mucin fibers. And then when it gets entangled, that's like getting in a very deep well. And the depth of that well has to do, you know, we had, uh, you know, some parameters that were sort of phenomenological, but basically uh, one was called a cascade factor. You know, it's like how much do the antibodies sort of conspire together to, uh, to enhance entanglement and something that you can, um, they, you know, in that model, you can study and infer, you know, a lower bound on a cascade factor like that. Um, and so the, the thing that's moving between the, bell, the, the, um, the, the wells is the number of antibodies that are simultaneously bound um, with the, uh, the virion and the mucosal network outside. So we do have these interpretations that come up uh, and we need, that's why we need them as we go through um, our, our applications. If we were just left to simulate, um, we, would be, we would be stuck in those cases. Um, and then, you know, what I'm gonna show a little bit later on is that we take this ergodic theorem for granted, but it's possible that it's not actually true in all these systems. So um, maybe that gives us a nice transition back to the next phase. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, I've talked a lot about um, directed transport, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, free diffusion and these kinds of things, anchored transport, which would be, you know, particles stuck. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, another type, which is, uh, if you look in the physics literature, it's called you know, subdiffusion, and there's lots and lots that's been written about it. So I'm not going to be able to capture everybody, uh, you know, all, all the efforts that have been done there. But, um, you know, one of the major tools that people use in particle tracking uh, to learn about different particles, so these are a whole bunch of Brownian paths, we know that, uh, you know, the variance grows linearly over time. So what I've done here is simulated a bunch of Brownian paths, which just means that at each increment, there's a little normally distributed thing that happens. And then I add them up, um, and it looks basically linear. Oh, that's great. Um, if we want to understand heterogeneity, we start to see particles experiencing different things in an environment. I mean, maybe not everybody's experiencing the same stuff. Um, you know, we have this classic question, how much can one, how much can you learn about a particle just from its own movement, not as part of a larger population? And so a popular way to, to assess this is something called pathwise mean square displacement. So what you do is uh, you look at differences. So delta is sort of the differences in observation times. J is a number of lags. Uh, and so what you can do is you can look at differences within a path, so the nth path, and you can look at uh, it at a certain time, 
uh, and then minus that, that lag of time, take the square of it, and then sum over it. So it's a moving average. Um, and for a long enough, again, with that ergodic theorem, for a long enough path, uh, you will get something that looks linear. Um, so this is on log-log scale that I have here. So log-log scale, whenever you have a um, something that's a power law, um, you know, go C, you know, some constant times the time to some power, the, the slope on a log-log scale is the power that goes with it. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, but in any case, you can see here what a typical distribution looks like for Brownian paths. Okay. And if you take our two, the, 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 the groups from which those two paths that I put at the beginning, um, where we had the 500 nanometer beads in sucrose and in mucus, uh, if you look at all their friends who are drawn from the same sample, what you see is uh, uniformity in the sense that a lot of those particles look much the same. This is on log-log scale, but with one major difference. If you look at the slope of the uh, particles in sucrose, um, you get a, uh, a slope on a log-log scale, which is 0 0.94 or 0.947, um, which is pretty close to one. But if you look at the, uh, the bead in mucus, you get one that's 0.585, which is really far away, 0.6. And in fact, if you take this, so we're assuming that the, um, the mean square displacement has some form of constant times t to the alpha. If you increase that mu mu mucus concentration, you get a decrease in that power law, in that slope. So, um, and then you also get a decrease that's a separate in the, in the coefficient. So this is called subdiffusion. Anytime you have on this log-log scale or you know, C times T to the alpha, instead of the, the variance growing linearly, it grows sublinearly. We call this subdiffusion. And the idea is that you know, as the, um, there, you know, the, um, you know, the mucin network, you can think of it just as water with polymers, they get more entangled and the particle moves around and there's more, uh, it just gets more and more stuck. Um, but there's a modeling question about where does this alpha come from? You know, what, what is it that, that explains that sort of like that shift as we get more and more um, mucin concentration? And I just want to stress that, you know, the, you know, the first examples that I know of of people using mean square displacement to understand heterogeneity uh, go back to, you know, Megan Valentine did this. And notice it's not on log log scale on the right, but um, she looks at particles in glycerol. So, here is the pathwise mean square displacement, and then here is um, uh, an average over all these. Here in agarose and f-actin, there's one super fast particle, and then all the rest are sort of doing some slow stuff. Uh, if you look over here on the left, you can see uh, that particles size is really important when it comes to mucus. So the guideline here is a slope one half, and you can see that you know, as the particle gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more entrapped. Uh, and interestingly, if um, you look at the size of virions, if you look at the size of viruses like HIV, it has a radius of 55 nanometers. And so it can move through mucus relatively freely. Uh, you can think of there being pore sizes effectively in the network and, the, and virions are just the right size. It's, it's this nice, it's this balance between being um, the uh, large enough to do the jobs it needs to do, but small enough that it can evade the mucin network. And so there's this kind of classical characterization of different types of movement. So I, I was marveling to see this on Wikipedia now. So I had to take the, <laughs> the image from Wikipedia. Uh, if it's linear, you call it normal diffusion. If it's sublinear, uh, the mean square displacement, you call it subdiffusion. Superdiffusion, um, you know, is that's what the directed transport does. If you have a constant velocity and then you take the square of that, you're going to get something that grows quadratically. So you have these different canonical types uh, and they tend to be interpreted. Like I said, active transport is T squared, Brownian motion T and anchor diffusion C. Subdiffusion is this thing in the middle. Now, the fundamental challenge as a, as a modeler with these things is that the MSD is not unique in terms of how it can be produced. There are multiple stochastic models that can produce the same MSD shape, same mean square displacement shape. So for example, for that linear shape, well, Brownian motion can do it, but also if you switch between active transport, which would be quadratic, and then anchored diffusion, if you switch back and forth between those, those can average out to look linear. Um, if you go to the sublinear regime, uh, the way that most people talk about subdiffusion is a model that's called continuous time random walk. 
But really what it is, is a, a switching between Brownian diffusion, which would be slope one, and anchored diffusion. You get stuck. Uh, Saxton is one of the first articulate this, and Metzler and others, uh, that you, you are in a stuck state. Uh, and then the question is, well, how long am I in that stuck state? And if, you, uh, if your wait time while you get stuck is not exponentially distributed, but is distributed with the right kind of power law, then um, the switching will lead to a sublinear mean, mean squared displacement over time. Uh, there are two other models, one called fractional Brownian motion, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but then the one that we ended up using in our group with other people, uh, which is let's take that Langevin network and think about it in terms of the generalized, uh, there's a generalized Langevin equation, which can also produce uh, sublinear MSD. And that really introduces the question, well, okay, given that multiple things can produce the same mean square displacement, shouldn't I be looking at other statistics? And the really important thing that jumps out when you look at a whole range of statistics for the uh, mucus paths is that uh, a couple of observations. So first of all, the increments are Gaussian. So we're still in a Gaussian regime. Uh, we don't see things changing over time. The system doesn't seem to be aging over time. Its statistics seem to be steady, although it's hard to have a rigorous test for that. But then the most important feature is that they're anti-persistent in the sense that if the particle moves forward, so this plot here is the auto covariance and notice that the first, these are time lags. And then this is from you know, negative one to one. There's a negative autocorrelation in the first step. So in other words, if I go forward in one step, I'm biased towards being negative in the next step. And if you look in this cartoon, you can imagine it. It's sort of like you have this you know, rubber band network. And if the particle goes one way for just a little bit, it entangles and then it pushes back on it at a later time. So you have this sort of anti-correlation from one step to the next. Okay. Now, um, how do we build this kind of memory? So what we're saying is past velocity works against me in the presence. So how do we build this into the Langevin equation? Well, what you can do is you can look at your individual terms. So my drag term, for example, uh, I had an instantaneous, my current velocity in the Langevin equation is what pushes back. But then when um, I, uh, but then I can generalize that to a, uh, you know, to any kind of function, k, you know, looking, reaching back into the past and integrating with v, okay? So this k is a, is a memory kernel that goes back and tells me how past movements affect my present. But then there's that fluctuation dissipation relationship. So whatever it is in the fluid that causes this memory also affects the memory, it also affects the fluctuations. So f of t, so notice I went from a white noise, this dwt, to f of t, which is some mean zero stationary Gaussian. So those are all the same properties as the increments or, or white noise. But the difference is instead of having independent increments, you have uh, a, uh, a, a, a memory that decays with the, uh, the distance in time. And it has to match in this fluctuation dissipation relationship what's in the, in the drag law. Okay, so this was, you know, we we're at that inevitable point in a talk where I have to throw a ton of citations at you because we don't have time to cover everything. But let me just walk you through briefly um, the history of this generalized Langevin equation. So it was proposed by Mori and Kubo and Zwanzig and Dixon. Um, and they were studying it just as sort of an intermediate time scale. It's the idea that, uh, you know, exactly the, what we're talking about that, you know, maybe there's something that is just, it's not, uh, you know, so. The Langevin equation assumes a time scale separation between the big particle and all the little ones that are affecting it. But their notion of the generalized Langevin equation is that you have a smaller particle, which is you know, sort of more in tune with its environment. And maybe it has, uh, you know, there's not such a clean time scale separation. And again, what we think of is that there's this polymer network that's you know, sort of remembering the past, if you will. It deforms and then acts back. Now, the uh, generalized Langevin equation was brought into the single particle tracking community by Mason and Weitz in this seminal article in 1995. Uh, and then you'll see there's just this explosion of analysis that happened when they, people realized this is a really good model for these particles. And there's a connection I'm going to talk about in just a moment, an explicit connection between the memory kernel and the subdiffusion uh, that's been studied by a whole group of people. 
Um, and, you know, of course, these things call for um, statistical inference, and there's a whole strain that goes there. So I always get as a mathematical biologist, you know, when does, you know, biology lead into new math or lead to mathematical challenges? And, you know, I always point to this as an example. You know, it just takes one, uh, you know, one paper where they realize that this is something that's out there, you know, that's been out for a while, but it connects really well to something that's observable and practical. And then other people notice this is working and then there's just this explosion of interest. And the reason why it brings in new math is because this memory structure, uh, you know, probabilists like to have what's called the Markov property. Whatever is happening right now is all that matters. Uh, and we don't like to think about things that depend on the past. Um, but this sort of forces, uh, you know, it'll make us a little bit uncomfortable with our, um, our assumptions. And so, um, so that then requires there to be a, uh, a new theory associated with it. So, what is this connection, you know, as it relates to us? Well, uh, there's a meta theorem, which the first that uh, I know of somebody proposing was by Morgado or, et al. In, in 2002. And then special cases were proved. And, uh, and then ultimately the graduate student I worked with, Hung Wen, uh, was able to, to sort of make the meta theorem a theorem. Um, but basically, you know, what's important about this K in terms of creating subdiffusion? So first of all, um, when I talk about subdiffusion, I'm gonna talk about something called asymptotic subdiffusivity. This is subdiffusion that lasts forever. So if you look at those, those MSDs, you might've noticed that sometimes they curl around and they have different behaviors. If your uh, observations outlast the memory in some sense, then in the long run, the mean square displacement will be linear, just like Brownian motion. So asymptotic subdiffusivity is, you know, what has to be true about the memory kernel so that that sublinear sub variance exists for all time. And the connection is that that power law needs to, I mean, sorry, that memory kernel needs to decay like a power law. So if there's some alpha between zero and one uh, and the memory kernel de decays at that rate, then, um, then there's this, this connection between the two. Now, what you might notice is that if K, uh, decreases like say square root of t, then um, it's actually not integrable. And Hung actually was able to prove that anytime this memory kernel is integrable, then our system will be asymptotically diffusive. So in other words, if the memory kernel is integrable, then at some point the system will forget about that and the mean square displacement will look just like Brownian motion um, uh, mean square displacement. Okay. So the beauty of being in the um, in the Langevin, you know, world is that if we want to subject this thing to um, forces, just like we did for the molecular motors case, then we can do that here too. Um, so uh, I can define again. I have my my memory. I have my um, um, my, my, my Gaussian process that has memory in it that matches. And then I have my potential well here, but there's something a little strange going on here in the sense that, um, you know, this force is acting in the present moment and somehow these things are collecting up all the past. And so the best way to study these things, and this goes way back to Morian's Wanzig as well, and so, you know, um, is, uh, is to make a, a Markovian approximation. And the idea is this, that if k is a sum of exponentials, then each of those exponentials basically characterizes a discrete time scale on which um, our system responds to um, you know, triggers in the environment. And you can, for each exponential, so you treat k as a sum of exponentials. And by the way, a sum of exponentials, if you take a large enough number of them, can approximate a power law. Um, to any degree of accuracy. And if you have an infinite, if you're allowed to have an infinite number of exponentials, which we work with, you can have an actual literal power law, um, which is what K of T is. And you create associated with each of these exponentials what's called an auxiliary variable. It's this little stochastic differential equation out here sort of running uh, you know, at some memory level, some decay rate. Uh, and they all sum together. So I have my, my, my position is the integral of velocity, the velocity is doing its thing, and then I have all my external things, okay? Uh, and so 
um, it's only recently that people have studied this. And to get back to you know those questions that we were asking um, before, you know, does there exist a stationary measure with this? Are these systems ergodic? You know, uh, so Pavliotis and Atobre and and then Goychuk showed that for a finite sum of exponentials that you do have a stationary measure. And in fact, it looks exactly like, I'm realizing I forgot my KBT here, so that's another typo, but um, it looks exactly, if you didn't know, this is sort of interesting, in these processes that sort of finite number of exponentials, which means it's integrable, which means it's asymptotically diffusive. Uh, if you integrate out over all those marginals, you're not observing them. If you only saw the, the position and the velocity, you wouldn't know that the memory is there in the stationary distribution. The memory all goes away. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the paper that we wrote um, with, you know, with, with Nathan Gladholtz and David Herzog is that um, you can expand this notion. I put an asterisk there because in the infinite case, there's a, there's a lie on this page. But suffice it to say that there is an invariant measure out there um, that is a good analogy to what happens in the finite dimensional case. Now, that stationary measure exists, but the question is whether or not it's unique. So ergodicity, this idea that the time average is gonna equal the, 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 the stationary measure average only happens, um, you know, as it turns out, so only happens if that stationary measure is unique. You know, the idea is that over time, can I go to one stationary measure or another? And in this case, it turns out, and you know, this is Hung's result again, uh, he, he really led this. Um, it turns out that you only get ergodicity in the asymptotically diffusive case. In other words, if that memory is, you know, eventually forgotten, okay? And, you know, so why does this happen? So I just want to give you one sketch, and one mathematical idea, and we're winding up in just a moment. Um, you know, how do these kinds of arguments work? You know, well, you know, the idea is, you know, if I'm going to have a stationary measure, then, um, you know, in Markov chain theory, there's an argument by Doblin, which basically says, um, I could start my Markov chain in two positions, and they sort of jump around for a while. And then eventually, if they land on the same spot, so I have a blue trajectory and a black trajectory, if they land on the same spot, I can't tell the difference between them anymore. They have forgotten that they were different. And from that point on, they're indistinguishable. Uh, that's called the coupling time. And if you're coupling time is finite in some sense, then um, you have a stationary distribution. You converge to it exponentially quickly. Um, well, Jonathan Mattingly, who was a mentor of mine in, uh, during my postdoc and really framed how I think about things. Barton Herrer, who won, uh, er, uh, won a Fields Medal, and then Schutzow, this paper was in 11. Um, they showed that, well, actually, um, you you don't have to literally land on each other. You can start in two different places and get really close. Uh, and you don't have to wait for it just to happen. You can construct a control. So the, the whole goal of these proofs is you basically say, okay, I'm gonna construct a control. I'm gonna take this blue guy and I'm gonna try to make it so that it goes and gets as close as I can to the black mark. And if they converge to each other at infinite time, that's sufficient to say, not just that there's a stationary distribution that it's unique, but that you converge to it exponentially quickly, which is what we want for um, these kinds of applications. But it turns out in this particular case that the control, if you think about it, has to go through the memory. And the only way that that control is integrable is if the memory is integrable. So we're in this interesting open question place where uh, what we can say is that uh, we don't know uh, if, you know, so, so you know, we have, we're trying to use the best possible methods. The best possible methods say that um, if you're asymptotically diffusive, then you're ergodic, but they break down in the subdiffusive case. And so, you know, there's this good question to ask, but whether or not it makes sense, whether or not, it, you know, any of these experiments, if we're seeing subdiffusive behavior, do they, on the experimental or on the timescales that we're interested in, do they forget their initial conditions? Are they in stationarity? Is, ergodic, is the ergodic theorem valid? Okay. So that's an example of like an open question coming out of these things. And, you know, we didn't expect it when we started, but there's genuine infinite dimensional dynamics that are happening. So to wind down this challenge, you know, it's the same thing. We use the Langevin framework to model subdiffusive processes. Um, and that, you know, this requires, you know, new statistical and mathematical analysis. 
Uh, and the question of whether subdiffusive processes need special experimental considerations is still open. Uh, the other groups who think about continuous time random walk, they talk about aging of their systems. It's something you have to pay attention to. So uh, my last slide is uh, shameless uh, advertising, which I hope that you will permit me to do. But this is Riley Juniman. She's an undergraduate. She's graduating this year. Uh, she worked um, with Christine Payne, you know, through the Southeast Center and uh, has worked with another collaborator of mine. And what she's been working on for three years, she's graduating, she's doing her honors thesis right now. And uh, we have just gone live with an app that uh, you can reach through my webpage, randommath.net. Uh, and if you click on the lanyard section, you can go uh, check it out. But it's a dream that we've had for several years, which is, okay, I've talked about these different types, free diffusion, active transport, anchor diffusion, subdiffusion. And the goal is to come up with a way, you take each of these paths, you uh, reduce it. We have six statistics, we call it the dashboard uh, of statistics, where um, you reduce the entire thing to a six dimensional space. And then she used machine learning, support vector machines to sort of learn how different, you know, you know with a huge training set, because we can simulate all these different paths uh, to figure out where they land in this space. And if you click on it, you can upload your own data set. Now, right now, we've only trained for 20 hertz, um, but uh, she's going to be working on other, um, you know, sampling frequencies. Um, but you'll have this little, uh, you know, this, this principal component analysis. Um, you know, output where you can see uh, the training set that she worked with. So we have free, anchored, active, and subdiffusive. And so the six dimensional space, you know, there's a principal components analysis. These are the first two components and you can see how they go in different directions. And each of these black squares. So if you click on information and then you download, we have a little training set that you can look at there. It puts your paths on top of the uh, training set to see if you know it's close, if it's in the region of places where we did. And each of them gets labeled in a little micro, if you hit generate report, there's a little Word document that comes out. I say little, it can have a hundred paths or something like that. And it shows you your paths and it shows you what uh, the diagnostic is. And so this kind of a thing invites uh, an interesting question. You know, she was able to do this uh, for you know, these six statistics um, with all this modeling and all the statistics, you, you, you know, the natural next question is, well, what is an optimal way to do this? And what are the right ways to sort of, you know, statistically right ways to sort of differentiate between these different models? And what other canonical models do we need to deal with um, to go towards this goal? So with that, I will, um, I will stop, say thank you. Um, and uh, I guess I'll open it up to questions.